The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at dallasgenealogy.org. Okay, and welcome everyone to our September meeting. We sort of take off during the summer months, so we're kind of restarting now. If I can get my slide to advance, there we go. We're the German Genealogy Group, and Anne and I are co-leaders. She's sort of working the control panel today. Uh, well, I'll be giving the presentation. Uh, we do have a presence on Facebook, and the link you can see there uh, at the bottom of the screen. And uh, as part of the Dallas Genealogical Society, uh, you can find us listed under the special interest groups of which we are one of several. And then if you want to go ahead and put the poll up, and we'll just check to see who we've got. So we welcome all our guests, which we have several. Okay. So we'll start off with some announcements. Uh, uh, first, in terms of our upcoming meetings, uh, Anne's been working very hard to sort of schedule some speakers. Again, we meet the second Saturday of the alternate months starting in September and going through, uh, well, we go through September, March, May. Uh, so our next meeting will be on Saturday, November 13th. And our presenter will be Gary Finkel. He's from the New York uh, chapter of Palatine's to America. And he'll be talking about from the Rhine Valley to the Hudson Valley. That's the Hudson Valley of New York, uh, covering the departure of the Palatines. Uh, many went first to London and then uh, eventually ended up in New York. Then the next meeting will be in January, and usually the Dallas Society meets the first Saturday of the month in the morning. But because that will be so close to the New Year's holiday, they're going to move their meeting to the second Saturday, the 8th. So we move from the morning to the afternoon. Uh, we're currently working on a, a speaker for that presentation. We've moved the one we had planned to March because she's actually in Germany and it'll be a, that's a long time difference if we start in our afternoon. Uh, but that is uh, Teresa Burns. So she'll be talking in March. Uh, and that should really say 1030. Didn't catch that on the slide. That'll be back on the morning. She'll be talking about deciphering German church records, uh, giving us some tips on the records and again, before they started their civil registrations in the 1870s, uh, anything before that, you really have to go to the church records. So she'll be giving some useful information on that. And then our May meeting, I got the time right on that one, will be Susan Kaufman. Uh, she's with the, what we always call the Clayton Library. Their official name now is the Clayton Library Center for Genealogical Research. And she'll be talking about the holdings they have down there. That's in Houston. Uh, but you can remotely access quite a number of their uh, records and some databases. Uh, and they have a MyLink card uh, that you can apply for to then get access to those uh, digital resources. So that will be our May meeting. So that sort of covers what we have. But some other meetings of interest coming up in the near future. Uh, and you can find these uh, looking at the International German Genealogy Partnership. Uh, we'll include these links, like the one there at the top, uh, on our Facebook page. But you can always go there to see a number of different societies, what they have coming up. Uh, this day, the San Diego Society uh, again has some tips on church records. Uh, and that's in the uh, afternoon. Uh, in the evening, the SIG of the St. Louis Genealogical Society will be talking about some of the local history resources that they have. The Germans are pretty good at keeping track of villages and farms, the histories of them. 
uh, lots of uh, good records available that way. Uh, and then next month, near the end of the month, the Hamilton County, Ohio Society has two presentations, uh, rich resources for poor ancestors and finding your German roots again in those farm histories, which are some documents that may be a little bit more unique to Germany. I don't think we have anything like that here in the States. Uh, we also have coming up here in Texas, our state genealogical conference. Uh, this year again will be virtual. Uh, there are 10 live presentations with questions and answers on uh, the 1st and 2nd of October. And those sessions that will be presented live and you can actually interact with the speakers, those will also be recorded and available through the end of the year. Uh, in addition, they have 30 other pre-recorded lectures. Uh, I have two of them. One of them is my German Waves presentation that covers all the time periods and locales. And those who are available, uh, the number that you can access depends on uh, what registration you choose. And then they'll also have a number of board bonus sessions that are uh, software demonstrations, how to's and the like that are available to anybody who's registered for the conference. So unfortunately, the early registration time period is passed, uh, but you can still register for that. And if you do all the sessions, uh, the, the live ones the one that first weekend in October, but all the rest as well. Uh, recordings are available through the end of the, the year. And then here in Texas, we have sort of a, a special day in the fall where a consortium of libraries all get together. Uh, it comes out of the, the Waco Library, but the Dallas Library participates as well in pre-COVID times uh, they presented and you could sit at the library and see them. Uh, now again, these will all be virtual. Uh, there you can see the, the schedule of those. And again, the link for registration is there and we'll post that on the, the web, the Facebook site as well. And in fact, in a second, as I switch presentations, I'll even go ahead and throw it into the, the chat. Let's see if I can jump quickly to that. So um, Bernard, one quick thing. Kathleen noticed that we had some dates and times a little bit messed up on a couple of the months there for our presentations. Um, March should be March 12th at 10.30 a.m. Right. Okay, and then May is May 14th at 10.30 a.m. Um, so I think we just need to double check those on well, before we post anything on those. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Kathleen. So let's see. Okay. So we have any questions or comments regarding any of that? If not, then I'll go ahead and start the presentation. I think I got the right one here. Uh, we'll be talking about the early German settlements in Texas, primarily covering the period from about 1831 to 1860. So we can first look at a, a basic timeline just to put things in perspective, because anytime we're doing genealogy, it's always time and location are very important. We can't look at things through the viewpoint of being here in the United States in 2021. We have to pay attention to what were the times and places like where we're looking at the records. So looking back a little bit in Europe, some of the impacts of the Germans coming to Texas in particular, uh, there were the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and uh, that led to essentially the abolition of serfdom, demand for constitutional limits on monarchs. So people were getting more interested in uh, their freedom. And it uh, resulted in the point that people were finally allowed to actually leave where they had been before as a serf. You sort of belong to the Lord of the manor. In 1820, we had the Monroe Doctrine which said, we really don't want to have more European colonies 
here in the Americas. We'd had the, the Spanish in Florida, uh, the French in Canada, and west of the Alleghenies through the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, we, of course, by th that time had the Louisiana Purchase. So now we were butting up in Texas to the border uh, initially between Spain and the United States. And then uh, as Mexico got its freedom, then there was the border between Mexico and the United States. Uh, and then, of course, becoming an independent country. Everybody sort of got interested in that and who really should be in there. Uh, for us as genealogists, 1820 was important here in the United States because that's when they started requiring passenger lists. And that's conveniently before the time the Germans were coming into Texas. So the passenger lists are a good set of records to document those. Uh, as I mentioned, the Mexican independence, the war went on for some time. Uh, the Mexicans were interested then, while the Spanish didn't really want people from the United States moving into what is now Texas, uh, the Mexicans were a bit more interested and were starting to invite people from America, particularly the Southern states, initially to come to Texas. The first permanent German settlement in Texas is recognized as the city of industry. That was founded in 1831. Uh, of course, we had uh, Texas Independence grad in 18, and now it was sort of a wild card between the United States and Mexico. And again, France, Spain, England were all sort of interested in addition to some folks in Germany about what the potential might be there. By 1840, the population of Texas was now up to 70,000, and that is up. There really weren't that many people living in Texas before then. Uh, in 1845, then it became a state, and now it is part of the United States. Uh, that resulted to some extent in the Mexican-American War, uh, and this was occurring at the time a lot of the uh, colonists from Germany were first coming to Texas and impacted how they got from the ports inland to where their land had been promised. In 1848, there were a number of revolutions around Europe uh, trying to overthrow monarchies. Uh, many were killed and a lot others were forced into exile. So that was sort of a minor driving force for some Germans to leave uh, and come to Texas. The first really official census of Texas was done in 1850. There's some pseudo censuses and land records and the like done before then. But really that's the first official one. And Germans were about 5% uh, of the population. We were about 10,000. They were sort of third to an extent, if you read the, read the documents, after the uh, Americans had come in from the States. And of course the Hispanic folks that were all there. And it seems they sort of always overlooked the African-American slaves of which a number of the immigrants from the southern states brought into particularly East Texas. By 1860, the German population had doubled while the state population had tripled. And then when we had the Civil War, the ports of the South were all blockaded by the Union Navy. So that really on immigration, but then it picked up to a large extent after that uh, into the end of the century. Another thing to consider are the land contracts. I started with the empresarios. They were granted uh, the right to settle on land initially by Spain and then after independence by Mexico. But they had the responsibility to recruit and settle folks in over the area by Mexico called Cohila, Texas in the early 19th century. So the contract was, yeah, we'll give you this land, but you have to bring X number of people in, in Y number of years, or we rescind the land grant. And the empresarios saw this to a large extent as a way to make money by bringing people in and then sort of set selling the land to them. Once Texas gained its independence, it also wanted to attract 
and again established uh, similar contracts. And in addition to that, they were also to individual people uh, giving grants of 640 acres if it was the head of family or 320 acres if single. And the Texas General Land Office has all those records and have been working diligently to put a lot of that online. We had a presentation last year uh, by Kevin Klaus talking in particular about the records at the General Land Office. And in addition to these contracts in the large groups, there were a lot of individuals also heard about Texas in Germany and decided to come over either individually or as groups. And then later, sort of after the Civil War, after the time period, which I'll be talking, uh, folks, Germans from the northern states moved south in Texas as well. So some of the key players, uh, probably the first is Johann Friedrich Ernst. Uh, all these folks often had a different name and alias that they may have used. Uh, depending on what you read, they were good guys or bad guys or a little bit of both. Uh, in 1831, he received a grant of 4,000 acres uh, as part of the Stephen F. Austin colony. And he's probably his biggest impact was writing letters to friends talking about how great a place Texas was. To, and this was, these letters were republished in large parts of Germany and every read about, everyone read about it. I uh, like the description he came up with after uh, what happened here in February when we had temperatures below zero. Uh, but he was describing Germany a land with a winterless climate like that of Sicily. And then the folks from Germany came over here and learn, well, yes, we do have winter in Texas, and some of them, in fact, could be pretty extreme. Uh, here's a map, and I put on each of these maps, I put Austin, San Antonio, to give you sort of reference points, and there's where he founded the city of industry in 1831, uh, and that was followed uh, shortly afterward by Cat Springs. I know one of our attendees mentioned they had folks there, and in the handout, I've got some references to that was sort of the second settlement uh, that they established there. Uh, next individual is Henry Castro. Uh, he became an American citizen and worked closely with the, the government of Texas. And as a result, uh, he was issued two land grants in 1842. And again, one of the provisions was he had to bring in 600 families and establish at least four towns in a couple years. So the one grant he got was over a million acres west of San Antonio. Uh, that's now known as Castro's Colony and includes several counties now in Texas, so the million acres. Uh, the first shipload of families came in September, 1844. And then in subsequent years, he established additional towns of Kihi, Vandenberg and Dehanis. He was, uh, again, with most readings, but then you find one or two that say sort of the opposite. He spent a lot of his own money to the point that he actually became bankrupt on uh, actually providing the colonists with uh, animals, implements, things that they might need that he could find for them. Uh, he spent a lot of his time in uh, Europe and as a result, chartered a total of 27 ships. And he was really looking at uh, essentially Catholics from Alsace. Uh, if you're familiar with German history, that's gone back and forth between France and Germany. And a lot of those who were German, once they discovered they were in France, the border moved, they didn't. Uh, a number of them decided they might like to come to Texas. And the transcriptions and the actual images of those passenger lists are on U.S. Gen Web sites. And I want to take this opportunity that for a lot of the records, uh, instead of looking at the big four, you know, ancestry and uh, family search and the like, a lot of records you can find uh, through the county sites from U.S. Gen Web, uh, local historical and genealogical societies, and the like. Uh, so this is really something you want to explore probably anywhere you're doing research, but particularly in the case of uh, these Germans coming to Mexico. 
the local county societies have a lot of these records and they're freely available. So in Castro's land grant, there it is west of San Antonio, encompassing what's now five colonies. And he started with the first town was Castroville in 1844. Then we have Kihi and then Vandenberg in 1846. And finally, the Hannah's 1847. And those were all along the, the creek there, the, the source of water, which was very important uh, because now we're getting into somewhat a little bit drier parts of Texas. And here's an example again of on that US Gen website. There's all 27 of his ships. And you notice most of them, they have links to them, uh, where they sailed from. A lot of them left Antwerp uh, and came into Galveston. In a few cases, they would stop at New Orleans first and then proceed on to Galveston. And again, these were all after 1820, so there were passenger lists. And you can see this is just one example of on the left, a transcription. And if you look at the top, there's the links to the pages. And there's one of the pages there on the right. So you can see the actual uh, true records that you really want to always get whenever possible when doing genealogy, the original records. Uh, our next person, Henry Francis Fisher, uh, with partnership with Richard Miller, got a grant of 3 million acres. Uh, again, this required that he settle a thousand families uh, of various nationalities, which German is listed as first. Uh, indications are he never set foot on that land. So he never really knew what he had, but he saw it as a source of making money. Uh, he did get it renewed. And then 1844, they sold the grant to the Aldsverein, which I'll talk about in a minute. But one of the provisions that he become uh, a member of the committee. Uh, again, he was really sort of in it for the money. And after a few years, the, the Germans recognized that and sort of asked him to leave. There is his grant, which is a good ways inland away from the ports. And again, we're thinking about Texas 1940s, not Texas today. You don't hop on Interstate I-35 and head north or whatever. This was really the wilderness and really into Comanche country as well. We then have the Ausrein Society for the Protection of German Immigrants in Texas. They were formed by a group of noblemen uh, in Biebrich, you can see there on the map, and that's where they did much of their recruiting. Uh, the two key players in terms of commissioners who were on the ground in Texas, uh, Prince Solms is there on the left, and then John Moisbach on the right. He succeeded Solms. Uh, the Germans, they wanted a German, essentially, colony in Texas and figured out the extent that Napoleon had deprived them of their principalities, that maybe they could establish something like that in Texas. Also, they could control trade, uh, be shipping German goods to Texas and getting German or Texas resources shipped back. So they were sort of in it for the money as well. Uh, Prince Solms there on the left uh, was probably not the best of businessmen. None of them really were. They were really underfunded. Uh, and then John Moisbeck came in and sort of set things a little bit in better order uh, as he took uh, control. The deal that they made with the Germans was you pay $240. So we're not talking about impoverished peasants. We're really talking about people in Germany, in many cases, already owned land, but wanted to leave. Uh, for that $240, they get 320 acres of land. That's half of the 640. The Aldrein would get the other half of that 640. They would provide free transportation to Galveston and then on to that Fisher Miller claim. Uh, every ship would have a doctor and surgeon. Thomas, they give you food, water, and supplies to last. 
a log cabin once you got there, the first year's living and farming expenses, and then that other 320 acres of land, they were going to use that to establish irrigation canals, grain mills, cotton gins, and all that. None of that happened. <laughs> uh, the ships that they, at that time, there were steamships, but those cost more money. So the poor Germans that were coming across were in sailing ships and they were sort of old and decrepit, uh, disease ridden in some cases. It was really a rough trip to get from Germany to their land. And when they got there, there was nothing there. And they had this satisfaction guarantee that they'd send you back. Uh, a few people took them up on that. A number died along the way either before they got to Texas or in Texas. They didn't really achieve those goals, but they did found the towns of New Braunfels and Fredericksburg and brought about 7,000 Germans to Texas. And again, you know, 1840, there were only 70,000 people in the entire state. So that's a significant increase in population. Most of them came from West Central Germany. Uh, and as I said, some died, others in epidemics. And uh, others decided, well, we're just going to stay in Galveston or Houston or San Antonio uh, rather than continue on to those land grants, even what was, again, essentially the wilderness. In fact, one of the things they had set up in New Braunfels early on was an orphanage for the kids whose parents had died along the way. There's a real good book uh, by the I think that might be pronounced. It, that's available in essentially all our local libraries that have genealogical uh, holdings. Uh, it's uh, still under copyright to some extent. Uh, so again, there's the map with Austin, San Antonio and the grant where they were trying to get to. Uh, Prince Solms first bought a small piece of land east of Austin called Nassau Plantation. And this was really sort of a, maybe a headquarters where they would uh, spend some time, the leaders, uh, and it actually did have slaves, which was rare among the, the Germans. He didn't really want folks hanging around in Galveston. So he set up what he called Carl's Hoffen, named after himself, later called Indianola in 1844. And as they arrived at Galveston, they quickly transshipped them down the coast to Indianola. The plan was then that the year only briefly, and there would be then wagons that would take them to that Fisher Miller Grant, which you can see was a, a good distance away. But uh, recall at this time was the start of the Mexican-American War and the US military essentially uh, took over all the Teamsters with their wagons. So when the settlers got to Indianola, where there were just tents, and it was in winter, uh, there were no wagons to take them north. Uh, a number of them, about 500 is estimated, actually joined the army, because then you got food, shelter, <laughs> employment, uh, others stayed there for a while, and then eventually they decided, well, let's just start walking north, uh, leaving behind anything that they couldn't carry with them. Uh, eventually, 1845, uh, Prince Holmes bought another little bit of land, which became New Braunfels, and that was established in 1845. And then once uh, John Moisbach uh, took over, he picked up another town, which we know as Fredericksburg in 1846. But as you can see, that was all short of the Fisher Miller grant where those 320 acres were promised. Most of the Germans stayed in New Braunfels or Fredericksburg. A few eventually went on to the land. It was really not the best land for farming. Uh, and like I said, Fisher had never even seen it. Here's the layout for New Braunfels and uh, what they did instead of the 320 acres, you got a lot in land and then 20 acres for farming. And you can see they had the marketplace, uh, the meat hall, uh, school, uh, 
Catholic church, a Protestant church, all established there. So they never got the big land they were promised, but they were right there uh, on the, the river. The Victoria Regional History Center. Again, we're not talking about the big sites. Uh, we're really talking, you know, like ancestry and the like. Uh, local groups have an immigrant database for the folks that settled in India, started in Indianola. Uh, this is an example of what you can see of Johann Henry Schmidt. And it's interesting because they did more than it's not just a passenger list when he was born and where. And when he died, when they were married, what his spouse was, the children that came over with him, if there were later children, uh, the ship he came on. And uh, there you can see lots of useful genealogical information that the local folks have done the research and put that together for us. Here's the example for Fredericksburg. And there, instead of 20 acres, you got the town lot and 10 acres of farmland. And sort of points out there in the, uh, on the left, the numbered partition are the ones that belong to the association. Those without numbers got distributed to the immigrants. And then they had some larger community lands, which are the ones with the Roman numerals. So they did sort of being good organized Germans, lay everything out in a nice grid. And you got at least a, bit of land enough you could live from uh, for those folks that made it that far. Again, it's the Fredericksburg Gillespie County Genealogical Society. Uh, you can look there at immigration lists I've got highlighted. And there's all the various ships that were bringing folks in, uh, mostly to Galveston, as you can see. Uh, and you've got links then to passengers who were on those ships all done by the local folks and freely available. Here's this example for one of Elizabeth Dietz. Her maiden name was Weinheimer. Uh, she died in, when she was 67. St. Mary's Garden Cemetery is the Catholic cemetery in Friedrichsburg. Uh, and they can even have that mapped out. So you can even find the place, in fact, where she was buried. So lots of good genealogical records there, again, available on the local sites. The other settlements to look at, New Ulm, founded in 1841 by James Duff, and then the Germans moved in. Again, you can see that was close to the towns of Industry and Nassau Farm. Uh, 1842, they decided to name it New Ulm after Ulm, where a lot of them had come from there in Germany. So in addition to those big empresarios and land grants, there were smaller groups and individuals that came in and settled. Uh, another group were the Vents, came in 1854. These were one of the few that was really a result of religious persecution, that particular uh, religion uh, in Germany, where they were sort of subjugated, so they decided to all pick up and leave. They were Sorbians, not Serbians, although it sounds similar. And they came into Galveston in 1854. They had sort of an adventure getting there. They first went up uh, or down the river to Hamburg, uh, sailed over to Hull in England, then went across to the West Coast to Liverpool. And then they were quarantined for a while in Queenstown, Ireland, and finally allowed to leave, came into Galveston, and then settled there in uh, southwestern Lee County uh, to the east of Austin. They're uh, particularly noteworthy because they sort of were a major group uh, forming what's called the Missouri Synod of Lutheran Churches and were there in. Serban, Texas, and then gradually moved around to other parts of Texas. But you can find a lot of those surnames that came over originally on that ship uh, in many other locations now in Texas. And again, the passenger list is available for that at one of the, the local libraries. 
is on the website. And there we can see these are the folks, the ship name, Ben Nevis, uh, gives the hometown, uh, where they got the records. In some cases, it's these Anna Blossig papers. Uh, and he was Johann Carl Teinhardt. And then here's his wife, Maria, and then some of the children. So lots of good geological records. The Galveston Historic Seaport, uh, which has that sailing ship, Alyssa, you may have heard of. They have an online database. So in addition to going there, which I have done, and they have computer terminals, uh, it's also available online. A lot of the information is from that book by the GUIs that I showed you earlier. And then they also have a link there to the Galveston County District Clerk for naturalization records that the folks that sort of stayed in Galveston and areas would have filled out. So again, lots of records available at a local source. There's the whole page. So who were these folks? They were not poor, impoverished people. They were middle-class peasants. Many owned land, which they then sold and got permission to leave Germany. Uh, some were artisans who, as the Industrial Revolution started, were sort of displaced. Uh, this one's from the 1848 uh, revolution were intellectuals. Uh, they had the money to get, pay their way to come across to Texas. And again, we're talking the time period before Germany became a country in the 1870s. So they were really spoke dialects of German, but didn't really identify as we are part of Germany. A number may have been part of Prussia, but to the south, they were not. Uh, they could have been Bavarians or whatever. Uh, so they didn't really bond as a group. They sort of stayed in their own ethnic uh, groups. So, for example, in the Pernalis River Valley, there were lots of Lutherans and Catholic farmers, and they liked dancing and drinking, had singing societies and rifle clubs, and uh, enjoyed having a good time. Uh, what we think of now when we look at things like Oktoberfest. In contrast, in other parts of Texas, like the Yano River Valley, were German Methodists and had nothing to do with and fraternal organizations uh, and probably did not interact very much with the Germans in the other valleys. And in some cases, when they did, because they were speaking different dialects, they would even have trouble understanding each other. So while we sort of consider them as German Texans, again, they didn't identify as German. They identified as their own particular region of Germany. Later then, after the Civil War, uh, a number of German immigrants were coming into Galveston, uh, probably more then than before the war, uh, probably got up to even 40,000 folks born in Germany and living in Texas. And one note I found is to a large extent, after the war, they really didn't go up into the hill country. They would either settle in the towns, the Galveston, San Antonio, or some of those other uh, towns that had been established like New Braunfels, Fredericksburg, and the like. So we have sort of a German belt. And you'll notice there was really not in East Texas. East Texas were the good lands if you really wanted to be a farm, but those were already settled by the folks from the United States who had moved in, in many cases with their slaves. And that's why when Texas became a state, that became a large issue because the Germans to a large extent who settled basically from Galveston, Indianola, then up to that Fisher Miller grant and all the towns in between. That's basically where they settled. And to a large extent, they were opposed to slavery. So it became an issue uh, up to and during the, the Civil War. But that's where most of those Germans settled, particularly in the early years. And we see to a good extent, the number of the towns in that area still have those names. Others for around here, for example, we have the town of Munster. Those were settled later and as I mentioned, from folks from the northern states who had moved south after the Civil War. 
once we got into World War I and World War II, then it was not a good idea to be speaking German. World War I, you were the Huns. World War II, were the Nazis. Uh, so at that point, a lot of the German schools, uh, the German newspapers, and even a lot of people who spoke German, that all diminished because it was not really the thing to be German at that time. So that's my presentation. What questions might you folks have? Um, we have a um, Mar Marianne Zavo. Um, you had a question. Um, you want to unmute and ask it um, about finding information for family that settled in Cat Springs. She's still there. I'm still here. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, my sister-in-law uh, has these Texas ancestors that I've been able to do some research on in terms of knowing where they came from in Germany and their families in the 1870 census and in various parts of Texas. They, they're mostly Cat Springs and Sealy in uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, but the problem is I've never been able to find a source that would give me any information on when they actually came in to the United States to settle in Texas. And I see that there are some things in general, but uh, Cat Springs is part of Austin County. And uh, I was going over the uh, syllabus to see if there was anything to help me, but you know, if, Bern if <laughs> uh, Bernie or somebody else knows something about that area and uh, could help me, you know, pinpoint something a little more specific. Right. Yeah, Cat Springs was found. I think it's 1834, just shortly after industry was and it was a friend of Ernst who helped form that particular town uh, and again there in Austin County you get, trying to remember what I have in the handout in terms of yeah yeah, yeah you but, you hang on a second I need to I need to get to my uh, legacy thing here about these people uh, I've actually identified from the notes you have that one family, uh, that w which was actually two families that joined together through marriage, the Kellners and the Kevins, uh, came from uh, Holstein and the area around Hamburg. Uh, and I know there's Hamburg passenger list, but I don't know how far back those go. And, right. Well, the, they most likely came into Galveston. So yeah, again, you can look at uh, some of the, the links I have there in the handout that I showed during the presentation. And I also have a link, I think, to the immigrants ships passenger list. And they have a particular I, I subheading. Know about the immigrants ships passenger list. That was helpful. Right. There's a subheading on the immigrants website, immigrant ships list for ships to Galveston. So that would be another one to check. You said you had an 1870 census. Uh, you couldn't find them or didn't see them 1860 or 1850. No, yeah, I don't think they, I don't think they, I think they all came sometime between the 1860s and the 1870s. Okay, well, the 18th My early 18th. My law really knew very little about them. And um, one of her ancestors was not very nice. And so she knows, <laughs> she, decided she doesn't want to know anything about them, but of course, that's not the way I think. <laughs> right. So if they didn't come in the late 1850s, again, the Civil War, everything was blockaded. So then it would be the latter half of the 1860s. Yeah, the, the, uh, I've got uh, people here that were born like in 1858, but I actually think he came with his father who was born in 1817. Okay. Because uh, there are several children born in the 1840s, 1850s that ended up in Texas. Right. And then the other thing to look for for Cat Springs is uh, you have to decide were they living in a, the town itself? Or I'm sorry? A, were they living in a town, the town itself, 
or in did they have uh, arms? I, I really don't know the man. The man I know the most about is William Kepin, who actually ended up being. Um, uh, and I haven't got all this right in front of me, uh, but at any rate, he wrote a book about farming methods, uh, and it was uh, considered the Bible of how to farm in Texas for many years. Oh, great. So yeah. he may show up in one of those 1870 era uh, county histories that were done, yeah. but also it would be the land records. It'd be either he bought the land from someone, so then that would be through the, the county courthouse, or uh, again, it's probably a little bit too late to have gotten the land grant in, for directly from the state where they were giving away land that nobody else had previously owned. Those records are available through the Texas General Land Office. On yeah, site. that's that's the other one I want to look up for sure. And the other the other thing, unfortunately, about this in terms of what I'm looking at right now, it's what's in my my legacy database. And I have binders three inches thick on these people. And there may be stuff in there that I've never put in the database because I, of my sister-in-law's uh, rather, you know, less than enthusiastic mm -hmm. <laughs> attitude about this. I have many, many other things I can do. But I wanted to make, I really wanted to see, to get this presentation because this is, this is something that I really should be personally, just because I should do it because it should be complete. Right. Now, as I say, the local sources are a good place to pursue these sorts of things, sort of separate from usually, like I say, we think of the ancestry and family search. And in fact, yeah. family search may have stuff. I would certainly go through their uh, yeah. wiki and look at Austin County, but also the this Gen website and then the local. Uh, yeah. Historical and Biological Society. There's a there's a book at the Dallas Library, and I'm sorry I haven't got the exact title, but it is about uh, German houses and architecture in Texas. Mm -hmm. And Cat Springs is in there, and a number of the other with drawings and pictures and things. And anybody who wants to know what kind of houses their family might have lived in, this book is absolutely great. Okay. And you are local, so you've seen the book in the library. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I know we have folks on today from like Washington State and the like, and you can contact the librarians there. Uh, and if you have a specific lookout, look up, you would like them to perform, they are generally very willing to do that. And if it's just a couple pages, doesn't violate a copyright or anything, uh, they could do that as well. Uh, yeah, the library. book is almost two inches thick. It is mm -hmm. extremely thorough. <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you very much. Um, Catherine, uh, Kathleen, sorry, mentioned the Portal to Texas History and she put the link into the chat and they have a lot of good resources for German immigration as well, as she mentioned. Um, the, the next person with a question is um, Phyllis Knox. Are you available to talk? All right, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, my question, my uh, family came and settled in Brazos County just in 1841 is the earliest date. Uh, well, that's when the county was organized and he was there. And according to his uh, uh, death, uh, what is in the paper? I can't even think of the word for it when they died. Yeah, that obituary. Died. Yeah, obituary was a long, mm -hmm. lifelong citizen and one of the oldest deals. Any reason as to why, and he was young, he was just about 20 and not even in the first poll tax in the uh, in the tax record uh, in that day because he was born in 1822. So he wasn't uh, on the poll tax, but he was the next year. Any reason? I mean, what, what made these people, because they're not evidently coming that early with a big group of people, any, any reason why you would have chosen? <laughs> Brazos County and Peach Creek area near College Station and Washington County, of course, is was right there. And uh, his his wife that he met was, you know, in that county. So at one right. time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he may have been one of those who moved in response to those Ernst letters that okay. were published in Texas and uh, would have come in most likely 
through New Orleans and then to Galveston. Okay. So, uh, if you can't find him on a passenger list in Galveston, also check New Orleans. Okay. Uh, because a lot of the ships from Europe stopped there first, and then that's where the passenger list would have been filed. Uh, but uh, yeah, he most likely came in as one of those early folks before the the big uh, organized groups, uh, but may have been traveling with a couple friends or the like. Yes, I have a couple of names of, of the people who were near him, and even his uh, the gentleman that they missed, the Hemflings, and uh, and his mother, the gentleman I'm talking about, uh, his mother married a Hemfling after she got here, so. There was not, I can't find his father and uh, some information like that. So even his name, I'm the one with the Sims and S-Y-M-N-S, S-I-M-M-S, and mm -hmm. don't really know their names. So that's I, when I look at ones, which you've given me a whole lot more to look at on the ship list, I just look for something that starts with an S and go <laughs> from there. Or I look for the two families, Warders and uh, Hempling. To see right. if I can find anything. So mm -hmm. anyway, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so Leslie Dunlap, are you able to talk with us here? Sure. Um, my grandmother told me that her father um, came to New Braunfels and I know he came through Castle Garden in New York in September of 1890. And he did his intention to naturalize in Williamson County. And that's where he was married. Um, I have not found him in any census. Of course, there's no 1890 census. And I'm wondering if there's any regional census um, for those areas where I might look. Well, he Texas. Was in, he was in 1900 census in Williamson County. Okay, so yeah, the Texas never really did a true census. And the early ones they did were really before uh, it became a republic, you know, like in the 1830s. Uh, although there is a book, a uh, number of them, that William Dollarhide has done mm -hmm. about censuses and census substitutes, which okay. can be anything from tax lists, uh, dog licenses, <laughs> uh, city directories that may establish uh, him in the location. Uh, there's now the third edition of that came out just a couple years ago, uh, and there's sort of I remember is it East Central and West, I think. Uh, and ideally, if you can find the electronic copies, they are sold uh, because it's just a book with pages and pages of links. Anything mm -hmm. he found as a potential census substitute, he okay. has a link to, be it on Ancestry or Family Search or local mm -hmm. area or whatever. Uh, so if, if you're going to buy one, don't buy the print book buy the electronic one <laughs> then that has all the links and you don't have to type you can just click mm -hmm. but that's one you can probably just start to look for uh there are earlier editions of that and even the earlier editions you might find in a local library uh probably have most of what he's got in the more recent ones although there are updates of new information mm -hmm. he's found um, mm -hmm. but yeah there are no really true texas censuses as such even the one book that claims it's a census is really mm -hmm. based on land grants because they did land grants. And depending if you were there before or after the revolution, and if you were married or single, that's how much land you got. Uh, yeah. But this is much later than that, as you mentioned, if he's already come into New York City. Yeah. Unfortunately, he came as a, a single person without any family. And so... <laughs> <laughs> where he settled is where my um, great grandmother's um, Swiss family settled. Um, her family, or her brother, married one of the Flugers from Flugerville, oh, and so mm -hmm. uh, they uh, all settled in the Copeland area, and um, then dispersed from there. 
um, after my great grandmother got malaria and had mm-hmm. to move north. Mm-hmm. So that's how they ended up in Washington. So, right. Well, yeah. if, if by any chance they, there was a, a local German church of which they were married, uh, looking to see if there's any records of either the marriage or the children baptismal records, uh, particularly if it's a, an ethnic church, they would often ask the folks, okay, the parents for the baptismal records, where are you from? And that's, in fact, how I found the little village of Puselsheim in Bavaria, where my uh, Meisters came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do know where my um, great-grandmother or great-grandfather came from. He came from the province of Posen in Poland, what's now Poland. It was Prussia or, Mm -hmm. or Prussia, Germany, you know, you get all those names in the census and have done a lot of research there, but just trying to find out if there were any other family connections for him in Texas, because I'm wondering how did he find out about that area? Yeah, because often when when somebody immigrated, you know, they just didn't say, I'm going to the United States. They were going to a particular location And for a reason, either because they knew somebody who was already there or had heard about, again, like I say, for things like the Ernst letters, or there was often a reason why they ended up there. Uh, Mm -hmm. Not not always the case. In the case of Ernst, he was originally going to Missouri. But when he got Mm -hmm. to New Orleans, he heard people talking about Texas and said, oh, let me go check that out. So he did. Yeah. Yeah, so it's always a mystery. And then there's the Swiss side. Um, (laughs) But I have quite a network of family that we're all researching that together. We're just trying to find um, uh, kind of a death record and a burial place for um, my Swiss great-great-grandmother who passed away immediately after she arrived in Texas in 1884. Um, They came to Brenham and apparently they had family there with a place waiting for them. And it was the whole, the whole family came over through um, New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And so just looking around Texas for where she is buried and where her son, my great grandfather, I guess would be my great, great grandfather is buried. So seems uh, to be a challenge finding cemeteries or maybe small burial areas in Texas. Mm -hmm. So could be the case if they buried or died during the journey itself then they would be sort of buried where they fell. Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't take the body on with them. So it could yeah. make it even more of a challenge. Yeah, they were already um, at their location, according to all of our family. Um, you know, we've done quite quite a lot of genealogy work on the families since the 60s. So, you know, just trying to locate those two graves. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I should uh, join join up with people from Texas for a little more um, local info. <laughs> well, and like, like um, Bernard mentioned, try the local historical society or the local genealogy, local library, you know, and they may know where that little bitty cemetery is. You never know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So anyway, my family names, uh, my Swiss family names are Muri, um, and my great-grandfather's name, my paternal side is um, Brewer or Breuer, uh, Uh depending on how you pronounce it. Right. Anyway. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks.
Um, I don't have any more questions uh, or people who have popped up in chat. Is there anybody else that has a question that hasn't mentioned anything in the chat, wants to talk and ask a question? Anybody else? Going once? <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. All, all, everybody who's out of state, especially, is great. Bernard, do you want to say anything else? No, like I say, appreciate everybody. Uh, again, pay attention to our Facebook page, uh, the group we have there. Uh, we post a number of things in between our meetings. And again, our next meeting will be in November. Okay. okay I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. This has been a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your fees have been supporting these and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, please consider joining now. Go to dallasgenealogy.org and click on the membership tab.